what's up beautiful people today we're going to be checking out a video that answers the question a lot of us or if you're familiar with the nation i'm sure you've at some point asked this question and it is titled why every country has military bases in djibouti let's get to it djibouti is a small country in the horn of africa that is most well known in the western world for its funny sounding name in english Indeed, Djibouti is a country that few Westerners probably ever give a second thought about. It's only about the size of New Hampshire, and it only has a small population of about 957,000 people, the lowest population of any country on the entire mainland African continent. And yet, despite its small size and funny-sounding name, Djibouti is one of the most serious and influential geopolitical hotspots in the entire world because of this. The sheer number of foreign military bases that have been established on its territory. I mean, just look at this map of the area immediately around Djibouti's capital city, which is also called Djibouti. You've got an American military base here, which is the only permanent military base the United States has got anywhere on the African continent. You've got a collection of French military bases up here, a French-operated air base down here that the United States also uses to fly drones out of. You've got a Japanese military base over here, which is literally the only overseas base that the Japanese operate anywhere. You've got an Italian military base wedged in here by the Americans. You've got another French naval base up here. You've got German and Spanish soldiers who don't have bases of their own but get stationed up in these hotels. And then you've even got a Chinese People's Liberation Army naval base over here on the other side of town opposite of the Americans and Everybody's out there. Why? Friends. The first overseas military base that the People's Republic of China ever built anywhere. And other countries are still actively trying to build their own bases here as well. In 2021, Djibouti agreed to allow Saudi Arabia to begin construction of a new military base in the country as well, which will likely appear somewhere near the American base when completed. And then for years now, Djibouti has also been courted by the Indian and Russian governments to construct some kind of base there for themselves as well. All of this means that as of 2023, Little Djibouti in fact has by far the highest per capita concentration of foreign military bases on its soil out of any country in the world. Right. And that kind of begs a question. Why and how did this little country in the Horn of Africa essentially become the 21st century's global military base for all of the world's great powers to set up their operations in? Well, a lot of Djibouti's significance and value comes from its ideal geographic position. You see, while Djibouti is indeed small, it also sits precisely on the western side of the narrow Bab el Mandeb Strait, immediately opposite of Yemen. At its narrowest point, this strait is but 28 kilometers wide, and it is those 28 kilometers that all ships must pass through in order to get between the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. And in effect, because of the Suez Canal further to the north through Egypt, it is these 28 kilometers that all ships must pass through in order to get between the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean, at least quickly. This makes the Bab el Mandeb Strait one of the most geopolitically crucial maritime choke points in the world, especially from the perspective of the global oil and gas industry and the state security of dozens of countries from all around the world. You see, while the Red Sea in the area around the Bab el Mandeb Strait never yielded very many lucrative oil or natural gas discoveries, the nearby Persian Gulf region on the other side of the Arabian Peninsula literally contains the highest concentration of oil and gas found anywhere on the planet. Approximately half of all the world's known oil reserves and around a third of all the world's current oil production, in addition to around 40% of all the world's known natural gas reserves, are found only here, scattered around the shores of Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, and Oman. These reserves include the largest single oil field ever discovered in the world here at Gavar in Saudi Arabia, and the largest single natural gas field ever discovered in the world here at the North and South Pars field in the center of the Gulf shared between Qatar and Iran, which all on its own represents around a fifth of all the natural gas reserves ever found on the entire planet. The Persian Gulf is therefore arguably the single most important location on the entire planet in the 21st century, as it is effectively the greatest single source in the universe for the energy that humanity collectively consumes. The eight countries around the Persian Gulf harvest their oil and natural gas resources, load them up on a container ships, and then ship them through the similarly narrow Strait of Hormuz and into the Indian Ocean, where they then travel onwards to markets all around the world. For the ships carrying Persian Gulf oil and natural gas towards Asia, the journey then takes them across the Arabian Sea in the Bay of Bengal, then through the narrow Strait of Malacca, and then onwards to the energy-hungry economies of China, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan. But for the ships carrying Persian Gulf oil and natural gas onwards from the Strait of Hormuz to Europe, the quickest and most efficient path is for them to then head west across the Gulf oh, of Aden, through the Bab el Mandeb Strait past Djibouti, up the Red Sea, and through the Suez Canal across Egypt and into the Mediterranean. 
before then continuing onwards to ports across the European continent. As of 2022, approximately 20% of the European Union's oil imports and 24% of their liquefied natural gas imports were all coming in from countries around the Persian Gulf and delivered almost entirely by containers passing through the Bab al-Mandeb Strait and the Suez Canal. Were either of these choke points to become somehow obstructed or blockaded, the European Union would in a flash lose a major import route for huge volumes of their oil and gas supply that powers their society and economies, and the only possible alternative route for Persian Gulf oil and gas to reach the European market would be by then sailing the very long way around the entirety mm. of the African continent, a route that adds weeks to delivery times and consequently adds higher costs to the prices of imports. Yeah. This risk was most laid bare back in March of 2021, when a container ship ran aground within the Suez Canal and blocked it all off to trade for a period of six days, resulting in hundreds of ships queuing up to pass through the canal that collectively prevented an estimated 9.6 six billion dollars worth of trade from taking place. Were the Bab al-Mandeb Strait to become blocked for whatever reason instead, the result would largely be the same. And that is a massive fear to Saudi Arabia. You see, if there were ever a textbook definition of what a petrostate looks like, it is Saudi Arabia. The country controls 15% of the entire world's proven reserves of oil, largely around its territory bordering the Persian Gulf. The Saudis are the largest oil exporter in the entire world, and they also maintain the largest oil production capacity in the entire world. The Saudi state is defined by its vast oil reserves and production and ability to sell and export that oil to markets around the world. 40% of the entire Saudi GDP is simply the country's oil industry. While on average over the past decade, Saudi oil revenues have provided a whopping 75% of the government's entire annual budget that funds everything from ambitious construction and infrastructure projects to the Saudi armed forces. Therefore, if Saudi Arabia's ability to export oil abroad and earn revenue to fund their government was ever put into jeopardy, it could end up literally problem. meaning the collapse of the central Saudi state and even the Saudi absolute monarchy. Monarchy. But the question is, does Djibouti get revenue for every ship that goes through there? Yeah, that would be the question. I mean, they should, because if it's a country, a small country that has that value to other nations, then the people living in the nation should be very rich. They should take advantage of that. I don't know if they have other natural resources or other products they can sell to the, to the world, but if this is the only thing they have, they should take advantage of it. Since nearly all of Saudi Arabia's oil fields are located in the east of the country near to the Persian Gulf, the easiest and most obvious method of getting their oil out to global markets is by putting them on container ships and sending them through the Strait of Hormuz. But that strait is vulnerable because at its narrowest point it is less than 34 kilometers wide, and the entire northern shoreline of the strait is controlled by their greatest geopolitical rival, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Throughout the decades, the Iranians have frequently threatened and boasted about their ability to shut down the Strait of Hormuz if they ever felt like it, either by placing countless naval like mines it. across the strait and or by lining the north shore of the strait with area denial weapons, like surface-to-ship and surface-to-air missiles and just attacking everything that comes through it. Such an action would probably trigger a military response from the United States, but it would also, at least temporarily, crash Saudi Arabia's ability to export oil through the Strait of Hormuz and keep their government functioning. So, in order to mitigate that risk a bit, the Saudis constructed what's known as the East-West Pipeline, which can transfer limited volumes of their crude oil from their fields around the Persian Gulf to ports over on the Red Sea, where the oil can then continue on to world markets through either the Bab al-Mandeb Strait in the south or the Suez Canal in the north. But unfortunately for the Saudis, even this ability has come under threat because of the civil war in Yemen. Beginning in 2014, a generally Shia Muslim adjacent faction in Yemen known as the Houthis rose up in revolt against the predominantly Sunni Muslim and Saudi-backed government in the country, and they quickly seized control over the capital city. The Houthis have allegedly received weapons and financing from the Iranians, and their zone of control primarily exists near to the eastern shore of the Bab al-Mandeb Strait. Everything is just political. Were the Houthis to become successful and take control over Yemen and remain aligned with Saudi Arabia's greatest geopolitical rival? Rival, Iran, it is conceivable that the Houthis and Iranians could coordinate a joint blockade action wherein the Iranians block the Strait of Hormuz and the Houthis block the Bab al-Mandeb Strait at the exact same time. 
and in doing so, deny the Saudis pretty much any way to continue exporting their oil to their largest customers in East Asia, like China. The only way the Saudis could continue transporting their oil to markets in Asia under this scenario would be the very, very long and limited way across the East-West pipeline to the West Coast, up the Red Sea, through the Suez Canal, across the Mediterranean, and through the Strait of Gibraltar, and then around the entirety of the African continent just to get to the same place where Saudi hmm. oil exports normally begin at anyway. This is why the Saudis have been attacking and bombing the Houthis in Yemen for years now, and it's why the Saudis have been so interested in building their own overseas military base on the opposite end of the Bab al-Mandeb Strait in Djibouti, oh. so that they can quickly respond to this situation and free the strait up if that time ever comes. But of course, the Bab al-Mandeb Strait isn't just of critical importance to the Saudis and their state security. Following but the if they build its military bases in Djibouti, wouldn't the people of Djibouti be in trouble? You know, because you're fighting somebody else in another nation, right? Russian invasion of Ukraine in Europe, the European Union has been steadily divesting itself away from their previously high imports of Russian oil and gas. One of the primary countries that has stepped up to supply the Europeans with greater quantities of natural gas is Qatar, a small country but with big resources. The second largest reserves of natural gas of any country on the planet after the Russians themselves. The Qataris are currently investing tens of billions of dollars into expanding their LNG production out of their north field in the Gulf a large amount of which is slated to be exported further to Europe as the European demand for alternative supplies of gas away from Russia continues to increase. Qatar is thus becoming a major component of the European Union's new energy profile, as the EU continues to increase their LNG imports and divest themselves away from Russian natural gas pipelines. But just like the oil making its way to Europe, the cheapest, quickest, and easiest way for Qatari LNG to make its way to Europe is also through the Strait of Hormuz, the Bab al-Mandeb Strait, and the Suez Canal. Consequently, the Bab al-Mandeb and the Suez Canal alike are both gaining in global importance. Even as far back as 2018, before all these major geopolitical shifts, an estimated 6.2 million barrels worth of crude oil a day were passing through the Bab al-Mandeb Strait toward Europe, Asia, and North America, representing around 9% of all the traded oil in the world. And it's not just oil and gas that makes the Bab al-Mandeb so important either. From China's perspective, the strait is a critical component making up their shortest maritime export route to Europe as well. China's economy is basically based around importing enormous amounts of raw energy materials from the Persian Gulf states, using those enormous raw energy materials to produce enormous volumes of manufactured goods, and then exporting those enormous volumes of manufactured them. goods to the world's largest consumer markets mm -hmm. in North America and Europe. These manufactured exports represent around 30% of the entire Chinese economy, and the quickest and cheapest way for their exports to make it to the European market ends up passing through the Bab al -Mandel. Deb Strait and the Suez Canal, rather than sailing the long way around either Africa or the Pacific. Ultimately, the Bab al-Mandeb Strait is one of the most critical maritime choke points that keeps the pace of globalized trade alive and well. Europe needs the strait to be secure to continue importing large amounts of their oil and gas from the Persian Gulf, and large volumes of manufactured products from China as cheaply and as quickly as possible. Persian Gulf states, and primarily Saudi Arabia, need the strait to remain secure so that they can continue selling oil and gas to Europe and Asia and keep their foreign policy options flexible. China needs the strait secure to continue exporting their manufactured goods to Europe as quickly and cheaply as as possible, while the United States wants the strait to remain secure to keep global trade from falling apart, and to keep the European oil and gas supply steady in the face of Russian aggression and energy warfare in mm -hmm. Europe. So US is just dead to, I don't know, okay, I, I was expecting, okay, my point is, um, Saudi Arabia is there for a reason, China is there for a reason, um, other nations are there to protect their trade, but U.S. is there to regulate other people's trade. So it's kind of like, uh Europe. That's why the security of the Bab al-Mandeb Strait is so important to so many people. But it's also unfortunately placed in a very geopolitically turbulent neighborhood. Yemen, which occupies the entire north shore of the strait, has been consumed by one of the most devastating civil wars of the 21st century for nearly a decade now that is still continuing. 
a mm. civil war that has claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people and has become an intense proxy conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran, as each vies for supremacy over the other in the country. On the southern shore of the strait is Eritrea, a ruthless totalitarian one-party dictatorship that has been ruled by the same man ever since 1993, and which is generally considered to have one of the most abysmal human rights records and freedoms on the planet genuinely on a par with North Korea. Eritrea was also locked in a really? conflict over disputed lands with neighboring Ethiopia for decades, until it was resolved only in 2019. But the very next year after that, the Tigray War exploded in Ethiopia just across the border, as the Tigray region of Ethiopia rebelled against the central Ethiopian government. A horrible conflict, which would ultimately, between 2020 and 2022, descend into the bloodiest and most violent conflict of the entire 21st century, and claim the lives of around 600,000 people. The Eritrean army invaded the Tigray region at the behest of the central Ethiopian government and committed numerous atrocities and massacres, and still, as of the production of this video, has never agreed to any formal peace settlement. And then there's also Somalia, a country whose very name is essentially synonymous in the Western world with anarchy and chaos. The country has been locked in a multi-sided civil war for more than 40 years now. There is really no concept of a centralized authority anywhere across the country. Over the decades of chaos and lack of central authority in Somalia, insurgents and pirates alike have thrived as they realize their country enjoys a coastline directly adjacent to one of the most strategically valuable and lucrative maritime trade routes in the world. And so, Somali pirate attacks on container and cargo vessels transiting the Bab el-Mendeb Strait have been frequent occurrences over the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yemen, Eritrea, and Somalia Who's giving them all those weapons? See the weapons they're using? are all generally unstable and fragile countries who've been frequently involved in both internal and external conflicts. And all of that combines to put maritime shipping through the Bab el-Mendeb Strait into jeopardy, which threatens the economies and security of countries from all around the world. This then led to the sense in many countries that a military presence of some kind nearby to the strait was necessary in order to ensure the strait security and the continued uninterrupted global flow of cheap oil, cheap gas, and cheap manufactured goods through it could continue. And so for the most part, that left only little Djibouti as an island of relative stability in a very chaotic neighborhood for outside powers to construct their military bases in. Bases which would enable their militaries to project power into the Bab el-Mendeb Strait and keep the flow of global trade continuing through the dangerous neighborhood and the various risks. But Djibouti itself is also a fairly autocratic country since it has been ruled by the very same president ever since 1999, Omar mm. Guella, and elections are generally viewed as being unfair and undemocratic. But that doesn't really, really matter because, crucially, ignoring some fairly minor border skirmishes with Eritrea back in 1999 and 2008, Djibouti is a country that has remained relatively free of conflicts in a region of the world that is usually full of them. And part of the reason why is because recognizing their status as a small and largely defenseless country in control of extremely strategically valuable real estate, President Guella has welcomed the presence of foreign militaries to come and establish their bases within his country. That will protect it from the chaos that surrounds it. And Djibouti's strategic location is important even beyond the shipping concerns through the Bab el-Mandeb Strait. This is because Ethiopia immediately to the southwest of Djibouti is home to Africa's second largest population of more than 120 million people, but is also completely landlocked, which severely limits their ability to send exports or receive imports to and from the rest of the world. So, because Ethiopia and Eritrea have been locked in some kind of territorial conflict for decades and have had a very tense relationship, and because Somalia is, well, Somalia, that basically just leaves Djibouti as the only possible nearby source with maritime access for Ethiopia to receive imports or send exports through. That is why Little Djibouti, a nation of less than 1 million people, handles more than 95% of all the imports from around the world that make their way into giant Ethiopia, a nation mm. with more than 120 times their own population. Djibouti's location and relative stability within its dangerous neighborhood grants it outrageously outsized power and influence over Ethiopia and the globalized trade network, which makes it a potentially lucrative target to many outside powers, which is why the country has been more than happy to allow military great powers from all around the world to set up their bases there and dissuade any potential hostile outside power from ever trying anything funny. 
And that is why all today you have American, French, Italian, Japanese, German, Spanish, Saudi Arabian, and Chinese military bases it's all not, though, isn't so much what if they fight against themselves? Crowded together so nearby to each yeah. other, and attempts from the Russians and Indians to build their own as well. Mm -hmm. All of whom want to project power into the Bab al Mandeb Strait and protect their own interests in the region. The American base in Djibouti is the only permanent US military base on the mainland African continent, and it enables the US military and their drones to conduct operations in nearby. Yemen against Al-Qaeda elements, and in nearby Somalia against Al-Shabaab and ISIS elements, with support from the French, Japanese, Italians, Germans, and Spaniards. The American base has also helped with refueling Saudi warplanes as they bomb Houthi targets across Yemen, while Saudi Arabia's own future base in Djibouti will help them do this themselves, after the Biden administration in the United States withdrew all of their direct American support for the Saudi war effort in Yemen back in 2021, like helping them refueling their aircraft. And then the Chinese naval base is there officially to help fight against piracy in the region and ensure that critical maritime shipping lanes remain open and secure. Though it has generated a fairly high degree of geopolitical angst with the American military base that is only a few miles away from it. Hmm. Both the Americans and the Chinese have lodged official complaints with the Djiboutian government, accusing the other of using their base to spy on their own base. With one incident even being reported by the Americans. See, I said they, they could fight themselves, and it's already happening. Americans of Chinese troops in their base on the north side of town, shining laser beams into the cockpits of American planes flying nearby. But nonetheless, Djibouti allows them both to remain, along with all of the other military bases in the country as well, because they all serve Djibouti's own purposes. Protect Who would Djibouti. dare attack little defenseless Djibouti and provoke both of the emerging global superpowers, the United States and China? Djibouti's strategic calculus here is really nothing short of a genius play, and the best possible use of the geographic hand that they have been dealt. Researching this video and sifting through the data in front of me was a fascinating experience. Yeah, I can And imagine. if you're anything like me, you're probably also just as curious about why our planet in reality works the way that it does. Well, that was a very good video. We can end it right there. At least we've learned why Djibouti has many military bases yeah hopefully the disagreement between the nations in the in, in Djibouti hopefully the the tension doesn't rise to the fact that they have to fight themselves in, in another man's land because now the people of Djibouti would become casualties but yeah I feel like the leaders of Djibouti they they thought it through I, mean, I think it's a good plan it is a good plan and why why are African countries just fighting each other like what is what is wrong with Africans like what is going on? Eritrea fighting Ethiopia. Um, I I just can't I can't fathom why African countries are fighting each other when you should be coming, especially in times like today, like times like twenty twenty three now, where things are getting hard. You should come together, build together. You know when times are hard, this is when you're supposed to build and reset and you know build some leverage, own some things for yourself. But rather, rather do fight each other. It doesn't make any sense. Um, you're even hearing other nations that are not in Africa sending weapons to support and sponsor this fight. Why? What is the intention? It's just disgusting to me. Very, very disgusting. Anyways, um, I'm getting my feelings. I'm sorry, I'm getting my feelings. But let me know what you think about that video. If you like the fact that all these military bases are in Djibouti, share with me. Well, it's the end of this one. Smash the like button and subscribe if you're new to the channel. And I'll see you on the next one. Have a very wonderful day. Peace.